It's the 20th of October, 2015, and this is episode 257. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. Cryptocurrency is new, exciting, and empowering, but we're not experts, just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer future. On today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin, I'm here with Stephanie Murphy. Hey. And Andreas M. Antonopoulos. Hi, everyone. So today's story comes to us from KeepTalkingGreece.com. And here's the relevant partial quote. Civil servants and pensioners will be subject to stricter capital controls than the rest of the Greeks. They will be able to withdraw only 150 euros per week, with a total withdrawal of 600 euros per month. Uh, The rest of the wage or pension will have to be spent by using debit or credit cards. And the other part of this story that comes later in the article basically says that all new businesses that start up in Greece are going to have to only accept debit cards or credit cards that go through the official system. The reason why this is something that seems like a good idea to them, or at least, you know, the reasons why they're saying that they're doing it is to combat tax evasion. And this was, so here's the relevant quote to that. The finance ministry plans to impose such a measure in order to combat tax evasion. But of course, not the tax evasion committed by civil servants and pensioners, as this is not possible as the state deducts their share of taxes before they receive wages and pensions. But rather, this is attempting to attack tax evasion committed by uh, owners within the system. So effectively, what we're seeing here is a kind of reshaping of the entire commercial sector of Greece in an attempt to try and capture all of this revenue that they perceive as going out. But in reality, it's these people who, you know, don't actually have the money to give, and so they're not paying taxes. And it just seems to be this this ever escalating mess that has been going on now for a couple of years. And, you know, every once in a while, it's worth coming back to the situation and saying, could cryptocurrency provide a solution here? Would it make it worse? Would it make it better? Are they coming to a place where something like this might actually sound good? I guess the kind of uh, obvious question here is, Will this solve their problem? This is uh, the t- classic policy approach of the beatings will continue until morale improves. What we see here is the criminalization of cash and treating the middle class as criminals and prescribing their behavior in order to supposedly stop tax evasion. And the approach to stop tax evasion is to increase surveillance and control by the government and further restrict the ability of uh, businesses to um, start up in in Greece by making it even harder. Because now a prerequisite to starting your business is getting a merchant account with a debit card processing system, which has its own requirements. It's already very, very difficult to start a business in Greece. I know I had to start one. Um, When I was 17, I started a business in Greece. I experienced, you know, the mess of bureaucracy that was there, and it's only getting worse. This is really just a spiral where in order to squeeze out supposedly some kind of tax revenue from an economy that has lost almost 40% of its productive capacity and continues to decline dramatically, you're going to these extreme measures, control and surveillance which in the end don't really solve the primary problem because, you know, what you're doing is you're funneling all of these transactions through the central banks. But the bottom line is that one of the reasons there's so much tax evasion increase is because there is massive corruption in the public sector, in the the government agencies. There's massive corruption that allows a whole swathe of Greeks, starting with the politicians in parliament, to have bank accounts all around Europe in various denominations and hidden from the authorities where they funnel the proceeds from bribes and corruption. And you're not going to solve that by imposing surveillance on pensioners so that effectively when they spend money at the grocer shop, you can get the grocer for tax evasion. The, the real problems in Greece are not there. But you know what this is, is really a, a prelude or a preview of what's going to be happening in many countries in the near future. We're looking at the gradual criminalization of cash and an attempt to put entire financial systems under surveillance and control. So we've now opened the era of digital finance. And there's this narrow window in history where we're going to have to make a really important choice, which is, do we want to go to a world where digital finance means that every single transaction by every person is tracked and controlled by governments, 
where the information is funneled through dozens of intermediaries who expose you to identity theft, corruption, and fraud, and where uh, cash is essentially banned um, in all but tiny, tiny transactions? Or do we want to go to a world where digital currency is implemented as a peer-to-peer, person-to-person, free, cross-border, and global system? Really, that's the choice we're facing, and you're seeing these early skirmishes in Greece, but as everything else that's happened to Greece, the one guaranteed thing is that it doesn't end there, it starts there, and it's coming to another country near you very, very soon. It's worth noting that, of course, they're going after these pensioners, like the, pe- the weakest people who can't really you know, do much to fight back against it. Whereas, uh, as you noted, you know, the powerful in society, the politicians, the people who have political connections, are just going to be able to leverage those to get bank accounts elsewhere and funnel their ill-gotten gains there. And Adam, you said at the beginning when we started talking about this article, could Bitcoin be a solution? I hope you meant for the pensioners, not for the government to track the pensioners, <laughs> because, because I could envision it either way. Like some people are going to hear that and think, oh yeah, that would be great because then they can keep tighter, con- the government can keep tighter control and make sure these old people are not spending too much on groceries at the store every week. The grocer might be inv- evading taxes with those vegetable profits there. I hope you meant that this is a way for the people who are being oppressed by the banking system and by the tighter and tighter financial controls that are just ratcheting up all the time, and as you noted, Andreas, might spread to other parts of the world, for those people to get outside of that financial system and and to choose not to participate in a system that's closing in on them like a a pack of wolves, kind of trying to just restrict them down until there's not much choice that they have in their life about what they can buy and how much privacy they can have and how much choice they can have about something as basic as the as the human action of doing financial transactions of buying and selling things well bitcoin isn't going to help them for the same reason that bitcoin couldn't help them the previous time around you know i remember when the the previous grexit crisis happened the last uh, one which was not the last one <laughs> just the previous one there's going to be more but the, during the previous Grexit crisis, I remember people writing online and, and posting messages to say, uh, why would anyone be stupid enough to keep money in the Greek banks? You see all these people lining up at ATMs. Clearly, these people are stupid because they left their money in Greek banks. Anybody smart enough has already taken their money out of the Greek banks. Uh, which really tells you that these posters have never actually thought for more than five seconds about what's going on in these countries. But the bottom line is simple. These people didn't leave their money in the Greek banks. These people had no money. They get a paycheck once every month or once every two weeks. In Greece, it's usually once every month. So when you see giant lines outside of the ATMs, on the last Friday of the month, that's just after midnight. That's not a run on the banks, and that's not people who left their money in the banks. That's people who had nothing in the bank until midnight on Friday when the direct deposits of all of the pensions and all of the public servant salaries came into their bank accounts, and they now have money for the first time. It's the situation where it's a race to see whether that money will last until the end of the month, Mm. usually the last week involves a lot of ramen noodles and uh, right if you've been a student you know that feeling and then the next paycheck comes in these people don't have money in the bank they don't have spare cash they don't have disposable income and they don't have savings what they're doing is they're living paycheck paycheck with pensioners who have seen their their pensions cut by 30 or 40 percent due to the nationalization people who paid their taxes their entire life people who paid into their pension plans their entire life who are now being penalized for the profligacy of corrupt uh, officials who did never pay taxes but are not subject to these rules. Now, these pensioners, they don't have money to buy Bitcoin with. You can't get the money out of the banking system in order to convert it into Bitcoin and use it in it. You don't have any other sources of income. So the bottom line is that cryptocurrencies are not going to help these people. They might help others who are not part of that system, but uh, those who are dependent on monthly paychecks and a living paycheck to paycheck really have no way out of this system well no way except for revolution and you know that's you you're seeing basically a breakdown of every single social institution in this 
country, and it's it's happening in many countries around the world, and increasingly things that used to be third world phenomena are now arriving at major European countries just one after the other. And what's happening in Greece today is going to happen in Portugal and Italy and Spain and Ireland and other countries in the European periphery because they're all broke and they, they all have debt ratios that are even higher than Greece's and they're all too big to bail out. So the bottom line is that this is going to continue to happen. This is a fundamental failure of the entire monetary system of the European Union, which is running in parallel with an entire monetary failure of the US dollar and the yen, uh, which has had Japan in that condition for 20 years now. We're all going through the same monetary crisis. It's just that some people arrive at the cliff before others, but we're all heading towards the same cliff. So you really think there's no way out? I mean, I, I, I get living paycheck to paycheck, there's no way out for that generation, but you've got to realize that among young people, the under 30s in Greece are facing 75% unemployment right now, which means that they absolutely have zero prospects. They are disenfranchised, disenchanted, um, unemployed, and have nothing to do. They have no leisure, they have no, no capital, they have no cash flow, they have no jobs, they have no occupation. Many of them are quite well educated and they have nothing to do. And that leads to social unrest. And you're going to also see essentially a modern European refugee crisis. And not just the, what they call now a European refugee crisis, which is not really a crisis of Europe, it's a crisis elsewhere that's bringing refugees into Europe. But you are going to see great migrations in Europe as well with refugees. You know, there's... Um, giant populations of Greeks in uh, Germany who migrated to Germany in the 50s and 60s, fleeing civil war and uh, dictatorship and economic problems in Greece. And there have been several waves like that, just like waves of immigration out of Ireland and Portugal and other places like that, both to the US and other European states. You're going to start seeing that again. You know, it's, if you're if you're young and you live in in a place like Greece where the unemployment is seventy five percent, the best thing you can do is get the hell out. And those who can are getting the hell out. So you're seeing this massive drain of productive potential at the same time. This is not going to get solved for the pensioners and the public servants who are caught in the system. The only ones who can get out are the next generation who can effectively try to start from nothing again and use a different approach. I have a ton of respect for my grandfather, but one of the kind of consistent points of contention that we've had between us is he became a self-made man during a period of time when that barrier to entry to starting a new business or to doing something was just so much lower. And this is a point that I find that we constantly disagree about is like, I'll, I'll talk about how there's not really much in the way of opportunity out there just because these barriers are so high. And he'll tell me a story about you know how a friend of his started making sandwiches uh, for vineyard workers and driving, you know, just like by buying sandwich stuff and by, you know, driving them to the vineyards and delivering them to the workers and didn't, of course, have any permits or permits or any sort of thing like that and made enough money doing that to open up a shop. And I mean, like you can kind of just fall on down the line. And it seems like that's the part that's missing is like if you already have a bunch of money and can afford the permission, whether you're talking about Greece, or you're talking about America, we're really just talking about different magnitude the problem it has. There's no more low end anymore. There's no more way that you can go and just start something for nothing. And if it doesn't work, well, no big deal. But if it works, then you can grow it in a way that actually is legally compliant. Seems like that continues to be a real problem. I like the phrase that the government kicks the bottom rungs out of the ladder of success. I mean, that really mm. like illustrates it for me. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, but that's exactly what's going on. And if we're talking now about a global situation where there are lots of people who are struggling, living paycheck to paycheck, not able to better their economic situation because the barriers to entry are so high. I don't know. I think there's still areas, at least globally in the world, where you can do that maybe by moving somewhere else, starting a physical business. Online business is a huge one. But of course, you got to have a computer and internet access. I understand that. But I don't know. I don't think it's so bleak that the whole world is just spiraling downwards and we're going to enter this complete global collapse. It's just a matter of time. I, I still have hope, especially for something like 
Bitcoin and what it enables. I mean, just look at what some people are doing in South America with Bitcoin trying to get away from the the currency uh, volatility and, and fluctuation and get around capital controls. I know it's hard, but I see some hope at least. I'm very optimistic too, but I think the the real issue here that is the problem for an entire generation is the issue of debt. There's this great cartoon uh, I remember seeing, which has two parents talking to their young teenager who's a student. They say, you know, well, you, you know, son, your generation doesn't appreciate hard work. You know, we started with nothing. And the student is wearing uh, this massive backpack that says $100,000 in student debt. And the student says, I wish I could mm -hmm. start with nothing. And that's really the issue, because whether it's student debt that you face here in North America, where your average student comes out with no job and six, seven figures of student debt, or you have places like Greece, where essentially the government debt is then passed on to the next generation in the form of fees and regulations and licensing and startup costs, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's like, well, great, the younger generation can go and start up a business. Well, yes, but in order to fight the war on tax evasion, that new business will have to take a debit card. And in order to d take a debit card, they have to put down, you know, collateral for the bank to give them a merchant account, because if they don't have collateral, they can't get a merchant account and they can't open a cash business anymore. And the registration costs are very high and the licensing costs are very high. And so, you know, if, if you need $100,000 in fees and licensing costs to start a business, you're not starting a business. Or you're starting a black, you know, a free market business. Or you're starting a black market business. I don't want to say black market, free market. <laughs> Right, which means then you've you've essentially criminalized enterprise, and yeah. and and that's exactly what happens. This is really an issue of global debt, unsustainable global debt that gets passed on to the next generation and becomes crushing. So that the generation that lifted themselves up from their bootstraps, yes, great. That's at a time when a one working parent household could sustain not only sustain the household but also send both kids to college to get an education. And now even two parents working full time can't afford to even sustain a household, let alone pay for an education for their children. And now the children have to get $100,000 in student debt just to get an education. You know, that's not sustainable. You've created this. This is a very different world we live in today than the, than the world of our parents and grandparents. And debt is the underlying problem here. And trying to solve that problem by penalizing the next generation is the only answer any of these governments seem to have. Well, of course, that's how democracy works. You promise people other people's money and other people's stuff, and they vote for you and you get elected. And then, you know, the problems don't hit until later on. Yeah. What about inflation, too? I mean, it's really hard to save and to pass on wealth to your children or the next generation when that wealth is kind of being eroded. And I know most people in this world today are not even thinking much about saving because they're still trying to just pay their bills that month. But even if you are able to accumulate some capital, it, it's really easy for it to get eroded or to, for it to get confiscated by a bank if you build up your own pension. You know, if you, if you contribute to your own retirement savings, it might just get ganked by a government. There's always that risk, that counterparty risk. Yeah, and although today inflation is expressed in very different ways, so in the developing world, you still have currency inflation, and that is leading to currency crisis, hyperinflation, currency controls. But in the developed world, uh, in the US and Japan and in Europe, the problem isn't currency inflation. In fact, if anything, you, you've seen almost deflationary effects in, in the currency. The central banks would love to see currency inflation because that would actually erode some of the debt, but they can't do it. They pour enormous amounts of stimulus onto this bonfire in order to get currency inflation so they can erode the debt, but it's not inflating. And the reason it's not inflating is because in an environment where you have a complete collapse of uh, middle class demand and consumption, because people can't make ends meet, the end result is that all of the monetary stimulus that's being poured onto this economy doesn't end up inflating the currency by creating consumer spending, 
retail sales, manufacturing, or anything like that, what happens is it, it turns around, gets funneled directly to the investment class, which is a narrower and narrower part of the population, and the investment class puts it into stocks, bonds, student loans, automobile loans, mortgages, etc., blowing one asset bubble after another. So today's inflation is not that your savings, which nobody has anymore, are really eroded. Uh, w what happens is that these asset bubbles make it affordable for people to participate in society. So young people um, can't afford a car, can't afford an education, can't afford a home, because all of the home prices have gone through the roof, can't afford to pay rent anymore in most urban environments where jobs exist, because all of these investments companies bought up properties during the crisis and then turned them into rent properties and hiked up the, the rents. All of the homeowners who became renters have jacked up all of the prices. So essentially, it's unaffordable to participate in the ownership society. So what do we do now? We're all part of the sharing economy. What is the sharing economy? The sharing economy is a whole bunch, an entire generation of people who no longer own things because they can't afford to own things. So the inflation isn't in the currency anymore. It's in all of the asset classes. And the ability to acquire anything and own anything is out of the reach of middle class people now. And it's getting harder and harder. Meanwhile, the only people who are progressing are the investment class. As of this week, I was reading some of the latest statistics. The top 1% now own more than 70% of the wealth. or so, No, actually, the top 1% own more than 50% of the wealth, and the bottom 70% own only 3%. It's, it's ridiculous. It's just enormous inequality continues to grow. So all of that money that's being poured, instead of creating inflation, which the central banks would love, it's creating asset bubbles, which are destroying the middle class and enriching the rich. It's the same situation, and it's happening all across the developed world right now. So uh, jumping back to the KeepTalkingGreece.com article, quote, Every month, the state and the pension funds pay for salaries and pension approximately 2.6 billion euros, which equals about 30 billion per year. This cash money is being used for the purchase of goods or services, and a large percentage of these transactions do not bring revenue to the state as the transactions are being done without the issue of receipt uh, or so-called fake cash registers, which are manipulated to show less revenues. Here's the relevant quote. In this way, the state suffers revenue losses of approximately 15 to 20 billion euros per year due to not collection of the value-added tax and income tax. Leaving aside the fact that they're saying that they effectively have 66%, right? So two thirds of what they are giving out in pensions will come back to them on a yearly basis in, uh, in tax revenue, which seems a little bit insane. If you actually step back from the situation that, that Greece is talking about, which is kind of the short term and look at the more long term situation, what their overall debt load is, et cetera, this is totally meaningless. Like they could, they could do this and, and it could generate twice or three times the amount of revenue that they are hoping that this will generate. And it still would not change the fundamental fact that they have more than 100% debt to GDP. I think right now they're up to 180%. It's worse now than it has at any other point in the financial crisis. So these are moves that are being taken. And then the, the, the irony on top of it all is that the government that is still in control is one that was supposed to be an anti-austerity for the people government that then was effectively beaten down by the reality of the situation, exactly as we saw in Ireland a few years ago, where they you know, came in saying they were going to they were going to fight this. And then they, they saw the books and well, the reality of the situation sort of just changed the, the situation for those leaders. And the, the final note is that in this latest election, which just happened a couple of weeks ago in Greece, the new opposition party, right, the, the only one left, which is the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn party, got 15% of the unemployed vote and was the third most popular party in the entire election cycle. And this is not because people love the Nazis. It's because literally every single other party has completely destroyed their credibility. And so when you destroy the credibility of the only you know, viable political players out there, then you leave effectively the unviable ones as the ones that look reasonable because they're the only ones that haven't provably lied to you and screwed you yet. So, I mean, that's the thing about all of this is even if we were to believe the rosiest scenario here, it just doesn't seem like anything can change. Greece has been bankrupt since 2009. Accepting that fact would make the French, German, Spanish, Italian banks bankrupt as well. And so that fact must not be acknowledged. In order to pretend that all of those banks are not bankrupt, 
Greece must not be bankrupt. So pretend and extend has been the policy for eight years now. And the cost of that, sacrificing on the altar of preserving these national banks, these various banks in Europe that are effectively insolvent because of the debt load they have, and the national governments that are effectively insolvent, has sacrificed democratic institutions, sovereignty, self-determination, elections, and an entire generation of young people who are now living in Greece in conditions that have never been seen during a time of peace on the continent. The last time a country suffered economically like this, it was during the Second World War. And all of the preconditions for leading to extremist parties like the Golden Dawn and the rise of fascist, neo-fascist, nationalist, and neo-Nazi parties across Europe, all of those preconditions of economic collapse and youth disenfranchisement and disempowerment are happening all across Europe. This is the price that Europe is paying. It's sacrificing first Greece on the altar of the banks, and then any other country that dares to pick an alternate approach to this. And you can say all day that Greeks don't pay their taxes and Greeks are lazy, but it's not true. The bottom line is that this financial crisis is never going to be resolved for Greece or for Europe. And that's not the point. The point is simply to extend the illusion that these things are solvent just long enough until inflation kicks in and the debt is eroded. And that's what everybody in all of the central banks around the world are trying to do. Here's the problem. We're now heading straight in to a slowdown of 